Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon to all of you. This is the book that I'm going to talk about today. And uh, first things first, this talk is not a substitute to buying and reading the book. <laughs> Under no circumstances should you excuse yourself from buying and reading this book just because you heard this talk. This is just a trailer. I'm going to tease you with things, but the real stuff, the plot, who did it, why they did it, all of that is going to be in the book and I'm not going to reveal that. The second thing I wanted to say was that this book journey started in this room in 1996 when I took a class with both the Johns called Contemporary Islamic Intellectual Activists. That remains the best class I have ever been a part of because not only did we read about very exciting Muslim intellectuals, but those who were alive actually came here. I met Nur Khalish Majid, and I volunteered to pick all of them up from the airport, and John was very uh, kind and said, go ahead, pick them up and buy them a dinner. So I got to pick them up from the airport, have dinner with them, have breakfast with them, then bring them here, and then take them back to the airport. So I got to meet lots of interesting people, like Hassan Hanafi, who told me uh, what he was. He told me that he was a watermelon Muslim. <laughs> Green on the outside, red inside. <laughs> that means a communist who talks like an Islamist. <laughs> so, so I learned lots of interesting things. So, so for me, this is like uh, homecoming. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, this is the second time you're hosting me, and I think it's now my turn to invite you to University of Delaware. No quid pro quo. I know. <laughs> uh, just do it as a favor to me, Jack. Uh, I will put that in text as a favor to me. Uh, I'm very grateful. A lot of my mentors are in this room today, and so I'm very grateful and proud uh, to be here. Uh, This book has been very difficult for me to write. It took six years, seven years. Usually things don't take that long uh, for me to write. Because once I started writing the book, I realized I really didn't know anything about what I was writing. So I had to go study, literally, as a graduate student. I even talked to John about doing another PhD at Al-Azhar or at uh, Jami Emilia Islamia just to study for this book. And uh, the residency requirements made it impossible for me to get another PhD. And, and John told me, just write the book. You don't need another <laughs> PhD. You're already an associate professor. So I started working on it. And then I realized that I had linguistic deficiencies. And so I went back. And I got a little lucky. A traditional sheikh moved into Delaware for two years. And I studied Arabic with him. And he was so kind as to continue teaching the class when the rest of the students had disappeared. He actually taught with me alone mm -hmm. and refusing to increase the tuition uh, to, uh, so that I could study with him for two years and then I went to Morocco. I also traveled a lot of the Muslim world. I went more than a dozen times to Turkey, several times to Egypt, to Morocco to understand this. The first interview I had was with a very prominent Sufi sheikh called Ahmed Abadi from Morocco. And uh, I tried very hard to interview him, and he's difficult to find. He's, he's the Sheikh of Kings, so he's always with the King of Morocco, if not with the King of Morocco, with the King of Saudi Arabia or something. So I went to his office, and I did an etikaf, loudly, near of etikaf, saying, I'm not breaking my etikaf until I meet Abadi. So Abadi comes three hours later, obviously very upset with me, and he said, you can't write this book. When I told him why I was trying to interview him, I said, why can't I write this book? I also happen to be an engineer. I thought if I wanted to write a book on quantum physics, I think I can do that. So his answer was, he said, Muqtada, if you have not tasted the orange, what can you write about the orange except that it's yellow and round? If you have not experienced the subwoof, how can you write about Assam? And that was, to me, uh, made me think a lot about it. And so I realized that I was trying to write a book that would change the world, but the real test was, would it change me? So writing about Ihsan, you know, there's a very famous tradition 
In Allah Kataba Allah Walaisan Allah Kulishay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the believers to do whatever you do in a beautiful way. And so it became a challenge for me. I had suddenly I had to be polite to people. It was that like, was a challenge for you. No. <laughs> it was like working for Disney World, you know. <laughs> it's like you have to be nice to people. I had to be sensitive, compassionate. I mean I can't get prettier than what I am already, but I had to change my behavior, my thinking. Uh, while playing tennis, if somebody drops a ball, I had to go pick it up and put it in the garbage can. So it, it became very difficult. So I, I actually tried to live life like a Sufi, started giving khutbahs, etc. Because if the book doesn't change me, then I don't think it is fair for me to expect it to change anybody else. So that was a real test. So I don't know whether I have passed the test or not. But as I was reacting and reeling from the effects of 9-11, I kept asking myself, this can't be Islam. And so the question was, what is Islam? And as I started uh, reading the traditions, I started coming across traditions which really inspired me and I rediscovered the beauty in Islam. Asanu in Allah, yuhibbul muhsini. Do beautiful things. God loves beauty. Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Indeed, God is beautiful. He loves beauty. And there was so much emphasis on being compassionate, being merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al wudud. It's about love. He loves us first. And so on. And I said, why haven't I heard these things before? I used to occasionally give khutbas. And the only reason why I used to give khutbas was because listening to them was very tiring. <laughs> agonizing, painful. <clears throat> and listening to some of those khutbahs, I thought, oh my God, how do I escape that? Coming from a traditional background, I was told that if I miss three in a row, then I would not be even be a Muslim. I said, so what do I do with the third one? So I decided I will do it myself. And so I had to go and learn, Inna Allah ya'amuru biladli wa lahsan wa itai al qurba and all that ayah. And as I reflected upon it, I realized something very interesting, that nearly every Muslim, at least those who pray, listen to this verse at least once a week. Because most traditional sermons end with this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded ihsan with justice. And to me, I realized for the first time that justice was not enough. Justice was not enough. So people in the last half, one and a half centuries who have been demanding an Islamic state and explaining the reason why we want an Islamic state is to establish justice. And the way we can establish justice is by implementing, applying, enforcing whatever uh, term you want to use of Sharia law. The purpose was to create a just society and I said, well, it appears that justice is not enough. God wants more than justice. He wants Hassan. So what is Hassan? And so I started thinking about it. And I, I actually interviewed more than 150 scholars. And by interview, I mean sometimes three days, four days in different parts of the world. A lot of them in Chicago, many, many in Turkey and Morocco. And it took some time to get a sense of it. And uh, and I feel as if I have discovered something which is at least transformative to my way of thinking about Islam itself. So I'm going to first talk to you about what is Ihsan a little bit. Okay. In, in the Quran, Ihsan, most English translations use the word to do good. <coughs> or sometimes it's translated as charity. <coughs> it, the word comes from husn, beauty. Uh, William Chittick translates it as to do beautiful things. In my book, I label William Chittig as Sheikh ul Hassan, as someone who's written the most in contemporary times in Western academia about Hassan. His book with his wife on vision of Islam is really based on this. So if you look at it, there are about 190 verses in the Quran which talk about Hassan <coughs> in some way or the other. Either Hassan or Mohsin. Mohsin is one who is achieved the state of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am with those who are Mosins, I love those who are Mosins, etc. But 
the profoundest uh, and from a from my point of view a cosmo a cosmological philosophy can be derived from the famous hadith of jibril so i'm sure everybody here knows the hadith of jibril uh where jibril comes to prophet muhammad peace be upon him and asks him five questions the last two are about the day of judgment the first three are about islam iman and ihsan and those answers that prophet muhammad peace be upon him gives to those questions are constitutive of how we understand islam today so so when jibril asks prophet muhammad what is ihsan <laughs> He answers by saying, "Antabudu Allah ka anna ka tarahu falam tak fa fa illam takun tarahu inna hu yarak." It says that Hassan is to worship Allah as if you see Him. In Arabic, "tabudu" would also mean to serve Allah. Hassan is to worship or serve Allah as if you see Him. If you cannot see Him, then know that He sees you. I think and this is my conjecture it is difficult for me even to prove it I tried to write an argument to prove it it's impossible to show the causality however so I'm going to just leave it as a thought experiment I think a lot of Muslims consciously or unconsciously accepted the argument that it is impossible for us to see God you know the story of Moses he couldn't see God he fainted so who are we and then there are opinions from Aisha the mother of believers that no human being can see god so we took it as if it is one of the allegorical things that is there in islam uh, to worship allah as if you see him and so those who gave up this desire to see god started focusing on the second part where god sees you so in the first part god is the one who is observed mashhud in the second he is the one who is witnessing he is the shahid so if you just focus on the second part then you become frightened of god god is watching you is looking at you are you doing the right thing you doing good doing bad he's keeping a record of all the things that you do and then is there's going to be a day of reckoning and on that day he's going to decide which one of you is going to help is your pants short enough is your beard long enough is your hijab very clear are you wearing nail polish on your fingernails before you do wudu all kinds of things so god becomes like this surveillance entity who is watching you and therefore you should be afraid of god and i believe that those who focused on the second part of it became the prototypes of puritans and salafis in islam today and those who focused on the first part where it's not the law as much as the love of god that mattered who aspired rabbi arini unzuri like oh lord show thyself so i may gaze upon you they became the advocates of ihsan in this world even though i am advocating in this book that muslims all try to aspire to bring ihsan in their lives i am not advocating that they become sufis and join sufi orders i think there is no connection these days between what the sufi orders do and what ihsan is all about uh, looks like they are too busy doing the zikr of their sheikhs to do zikr of allah this is all about my sheikh my sheikh my sheikh my sheikh my sheikh was such a great social justice warrior my sheikh did this for social justice my sheikh did that for social justice and when you call them to come out and stand up for social justice in their time and place they are too busy telling the story of their sheikh to somebody else that is not following the sunnah of your sheikh so i'm not very hot on the sufi orders themselves but the sufi sheikhs that they admire yes they did a lot of things and i will talk a little bit about that so i started wondering as to how profound this was one of the most profoundest mystical experiences i think if humanity and that of prophet muhammad peace be upon him is his night journey of miraj and in the quran at least in two places the first chapter first verse of chapter 17 and the 18th verse of chapter 53 of isra and surah an-najm 
the Quran says, in Israel, the Quran says that God took Prophet Muhammad from the near mosque to the faraway mosque in order to show him some of his signs. In Surah Al-Najm he says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, saw the greatest of God's signs. I don't think that we can ever see God in his entirety, ever, in this or ever life, because of the huge ontological difference between us and him. However, I do believe, and there is a tradition to that which says that the believing heart can encompass all of God. And therefore, the Prophet Muhammad on several occasions has said that he saw God through the eyes of his heart. But it is after Mirage that we got prayers as obligatory, the five obligatory prayers. And if Prophet Muhammad had seen some of the signs of God on that night, then when he was praying, it was not as if he's seeing God. He was praying like he had seen God, or at least some of the signs of God. So to me, that is very, very important. <coughs> that is what we as followers of Sunnah need to do, is to try to live life as if we are seeing God. Live life as if you have made eye contact with God. So whatever you do, do it beautifully. So why not in politics? If you are going to do Ihsan in every aspect of life, how do we bring Ihsan into political life? That became the foundational question to this book, which ultimately dabbles with mysticism and then becomes a political philosophy book. These are the seven chapters, in, uh, one, two, three, six chapters in the book that matter other than the introduction and the conclusion. So in the first chapter of the book, I make the argument by using only two case studies. One very simplistic, non-political case study, uh, and one highly politicized case study. The first case study is, what should Muslims do to compensate for breaking a fast in the month of Ramadan if you have sex with your wife? And the other one is on the issue of blasphemy. Should we kill the person who blasphemes Prophet Muhammad? And I looked at the debates among scholars in Pakistan, and I have concluded that it appears that many of the ulama, when they look at traditions, they take out ihsan and then whatever is left, they call it sharia. Mm -hmm. They take out everything that is beautiful, compassionate, especially forgiving. They take it out and come up with the hardest. Mm -hmm. For example, if you br break the fast in month of Ramadan by having sex with your wife, which is, having sex with your wife is halal, but not halal in the month of, while you're fasting. A man did that, came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm ruined, I did this. So the Prophet said, can you free a slave? He said, no, I don't have any slaves. So he said, can you fast 60 days? So he says, fasting is my problem, can you see? So the Prophet said, can you feed 60 people? And he says, no, I can't feed 60 people. And then suddenly there's another man who appears in the mosque and starts distributing dates, and he gives a basket of dates to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the Prophet turns to the man and says, you know what, take this basket of dates and feed poor people. And the man responds by saying that between the two mountains of Medina, there is nobody poorer than I am. And uh, Abu Huraira says this is the first time I think he saw the teeth of Prophet Muhammad. He not only smiled, but he grinned at the man. And he said, you know what, why don't you take the dates home and enjoy it with your family? <laughs> This is the only source. Every fatwa on the internet, in the books of faith, etc., on this issue says, if you break the fast doing so, then you should either fast 60 days or feed 60 people. So if we are deriving the law from the sunnah, even though the Quran says if you miss one fast for being sick or traveler, you re replace it with only one fast. So we decided to keep the Quran aside, silence the Quran because we have a specific episode in the hadith literature. Now, hadith becomes the source for law, and that hadith essentially, I don't understand why we ignore the sunnah of the Prophet from that hadith. So scholars are reading that hadith, and they're ignoring how Prophet Muhammad dealt with that map, recognizing the frailties, the weaknesses of human being, compassionate and understanding. All of that is left out, and they say, you should do these two things. The Hanafis, supposedly the rational 
the most rational of these legal schools, comes up with a very interesting interpretation of that. They say that if you fast for 59 days and then miss the 60th, then you start all over again. I said, wow, I mean, couldn't you get tougher than this? And while you're also doing that, walk on one leg alone. And if possible, on your head rather than your feet. I mean, can you make it even harder? The verse in the Quran which talks about replacing one fast with one fast ends by saying God's purpose is not to make things hard for you. And our scholars seem to find them. They're struggling to make it as hard as possible. So it is my contention, and I'm sure that legal scholars are going to say two examples are not enough. I'm sure 50, if I had included 50, 5,000 would not have been enough. <laughs> but the point is that on many, many issues, whether it's issue of blasphemy, pluralism, or, or adultery, or all kinds of things, Muslim scholars, legal scholars, seem to be err on the side of coming up with the toughest, the harshest interpretation than the softest. There's a verse in the Quran which says, when you hear the words of God, try to extract the most beautiful meaning from it. I have a whole section on epistemology and Ihsan. I would ask you to read the commentary of that verse. So how can you extract the most beautiful meaning from these traditions? That is a question. So I think we need to revisit how we go about interpreting law and follow this ayah that in Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan we do not remove ihsan from the sunnah of the prophet when he was interpreting the law and also applying the law so in the first chapter the, the case of the blasphemy is too complicated for me to talk about it but you should read it and it's easier for me to show how political considerations have led the scholars of pakistan to come up with some of the harshest interpretations of islamic law possible I mean, they are so far away from Ihsan, it is unbelievable. And uh, also far away from their own espoused methodologies of extracting rulings. In the second chapter, Islam as Identity, I argue that in 150 plus years of Islamic revivalism, Muslims have ended up reducing Islam to an identity, rather being a, a repository of values that should be constitutive to our lives, it's tending to become more and more of an identity. Uh, and so it's becoming performative. You're performing on a stage. Uh, so Muslims these days are performing for their neighbors, for the television, and so on and so forth. So there is a performative aspect to Islam. And uh, so there is an externality. The focus is a lot on externality. Of, uh, of the Masjid, you know. After 9-11, every mosque had a blonde hijabi ready to face the media. That was her only role. She was not on the board, she was never invited to help interpret Islam <laughs> and run the mosque. But when the TV cameras came to the mosque, we had to have, you know, the new face of Islam right there. There's a premium to white Muslims in this country. So it is an externality. What Hassan taught me is that Islam is about interior decoration, not external mm. manifestations. So I argue in that case that perhaps this entire Islamic revivalism that has been going on ultimately uh, ending up with this call for an Islamic state is more about uh, legitimizing politics, uh, more about, uh, about uh, an external manifestation of faith. And you don't even have to look at Muslim politicians. If you look at Narendra Modi, if you look at Trump and others, if they have achievements based on good governance that they can brag about, then they don't need religion. The moment politicians start using religions to justify themselves is because their policies about good governance has failed. So for a case in India, I'm. I pray every day that Narendra Modi's economic policies be successful. So the next election, he cannot go back and say, look, I have screwed Muslims, vote for me. He can go and say, oh, look, I reduced unemployment. Look, I raised your per capita income. Look, I made India great again. Vote for me. Please do that. So invocation of religion as the legitimacy of politics comes from this perception of it as an identity. I am a Muslim. We were so proud of Muhammad Musi. May his soul rest in peace because he was half as a Quran and prayed five times a day. 
we never talk about his governing achievements. When people talk about Erdogan, they send me videos of him reciting the Quran. So this is all about external aspects of it, not about internal aspects. And as politics, no one talks about good governance. It's only when good governance was being achieved, I never saw the videos of him reciting the Quran. When the economy was not doing well, suddenly the religious side of it becomes very, very prominent, the grand mosques that are built and so on and so forth. So I, I, I make the argument that that's perhaps not what the purpose of the faith really is. The third and the fourth chapter are about Ahsan. In the third chapter, I try to literally summarize everything that's written about Ahsan in the Quran, in all the Hadith literature. Uh, some of the contemporary writings, I found two very interesting books, one written by a Salafi Sheikh, Sheikh Hassan from Egypt, who, whose dissertation was on Ahsan, and then the famous Sheikh Yasin of Morocco, who wrote the book Adul wa Ahsan. So I extensively review those books. I look at how Western scholars, Muslim scholars, Pakistani, Indian scholars, all over the centuries, Sufis, non-Sufis have looked at Ahsan. I also found that there's a tendency to veil Ahsan among some scholars. So for example, I, I review three or four verses from the Quran which use the word Wahua Muhsin, while you are a Muhsin. And I found something very interesting, except, except Ibn Arabi, nobody in their commentaries connected Muhsin to Ihsan. Tabari continues to define, including those verses that I reviewed, Muhsin as one who follows the Sharia. So it's like me, my interpretation of that is like saying, what is a PhD? A PhD is a high school graduate. No, high school graduate is a high school graduate. Just adhering to the Sharia is bare minimum. If you violate the Sharia, you're not even a Muslim. But there's more to it. You have to do a lot more beyond just adherence of the law to become a Muslim. Compassion, sacrifice, love, etc. Even in the ritual sense, uh, doing a lot of nawafil is important to achieve a sad. So there is a tendency to wear. It's like it's like today, imagine a, an American Muslim on TV, on CNN or Fox, and someone says, so well, who's a mujahid? You will see this gentleman struggle to explain mujahid without using the word jihad, right? Uh, you don't want to go there right now. So mujahid, hard worker, struggle, someone who does this, that. So most people are trying to talk about Mohsin without talking about Ahsan. Ibn Arabi doesn't feel the need to write 10 pages. It just says that the Mohsin is one who has reached the state of Ahsan who is fana fil Allah and baha fil Allah. That's it. Three lines, it's over. So to me, that was very interesting. Imam Abu Hanifa talks about the deen and describes it as Islam and Iman. In the hadith of Jibreel, Prophet ends the hadith by asking Umar, do you know who this man was? And he says, I don't know. He said, that was Jibreel who came to teach you your deen. So your deen is Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the understanding of the Day of Judgment. So there seems to be also a tendency to veil Ihsan, fear that it may lead people to become Sufis, I think. And if you look at contemporary Maulana Shafiuddin, etc., oh, they're very clear. They'll say, oh, the liberals will use this to be nice to Christians and Jews. Oh, the liberals will use this to be tolerant towards people, so we should block this. <laughs> I've actually quoted some of the stuff. It's the fear of liberals and fear of compassionate understanding of the Quran tends to move them away from Ahsan. Ibn Taymiyyah was the first to talk about Ahsan in the context of hierarchy. He is the first to use the word darajat. Islam, Iman, Ahsan is darajat. And since then, everybody now talks about darajat. But they are not different darajat. They are different things. Actually, I like William Chittick's characterization. To him, Islam is about action. Iman is about thought. And Ihsan is a state of being. It's an ontological state. Ihsan is both a maqam and a hal. It is a destination, and it is also a state. So in the fourth chapter, I revisit the same sources again and again and again, and I unpack Ihsan and I argue that Ihsan is about, basically, we are following the 
Sunnah of God. God is bearing witness to us and we are bearing witness to him. In uh, chapter Surat al-Mulk, the second verse, God says, I created death. God says, خَلَقَ الْمَوْتْ وَالْحَيَاتِ لِيَبْلُكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا I have created death and life in order that I might test you with Ahsan. I want to see which of you achieves Ahsan. So I'm maintaining that the purpose of human existence is to achieve Ahsan. It's very distracting because I got distracted by why did he say death first? And to me, it was also fascinating that God created death. We, I always thought of death as the absence of life or end of life, but I realized that death also needed to be created. But I still can't resist the philosophical attraction of perceiving that line of thought. But that's not the point. To me, the point that I'm drawing from this is perhaps the purpose of existence is to do Ahsan. And what is Ahsan is to, to bear witness to the beauty of God. And it's not just bearing witness. You bear witness beautifully. You bear witness beautifully. So, so you are also bearing witness to God as God is bearing witness to you. Both are shahid and mashud in this case. So how do we then, that's the point, how do we then bring that into the political realm? That is the ultimate question that I want to answer that nobody had actually tried to address. I had a lot of trouble getting the book through. People, sometimes the book was rejected within 10 minutes. Harvard University Press, I have both my submission and the rejection, which came within literally less than two hours. And the uh, University of North Carolina sat on it for seven months and also rejected it. And nearly everybody was rejecting it because the book had proscriptive qualities to it. Oxford also <laughs> rejected it. So I was, and I didn't want to write. I was already an associate professor. I said, okay, fine, I'll retire as an associate, but I'm not going to write with Islam as an object, as me, as some objective scientist observing Islam through a lens. And, you know, it's, I find that ridiculous. When I was a graduate student and I said I want to study Islam, people told me, no, 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 you should not study Islam. You're a Muslim. How can you be objective? Three professors actually told me, as a Muslim, you will not be able to be objective. And I thought, really? So no American should be writing about America. No American should write about American history, American foreign policy. We should leave it all to the Russians and PRT to write about American history, American politics, American culture, all of it. So then, of course, I realized just, just as white people's skin is bulletproof, they are also very objective people, the only people, Americans. Muslims can't be objective. Anyway, I said, forget it. I will write the book as a believer. Uh, whether it matters or not. And so my whole argument was, but anyway, the reviewers also demanded that I show that this is theirs, part of tradition, and not that I'm just conjuring it out of nowhere. I said, if I conjure it out of nowhere, there will be 500 dissertations on me tomorrow, <coughs> which will all be published by Oxford and Cambridge. They won't publish the original work, but the dissertations on it will be published. <laughs> But anyway, so I took the reviews and took another year off and wrote a 70-page genealogy of Islamic political philosophy, in which I argued that there are five, I picked five stereotypes. And I said one way of Muslims thinking about politics is philosophical. So I looked at Al-Farabi and his aspiration for a virtuous state. Then I looked at Ibn Khaldun and argued this is the closest that we have in our tradition to modern political theorists who try to be realist uh, and then I looked at Ibn Taymiyyah as a theologian, al Mawardi as a... Mawardi is more like a policy wonk, sitting at a think tank, legitimizing his boss. You know, He would have been Sean Hannity to the caliph. So he was basically saying, everything is okay, this is how it should be, only Sunni Arabs from Saudi Arabia should be caliphs. Uh, so he made a theory of, of the caliphate. So these are the four models which already exist. Ibn Taymiyyah is the most influential with contemporary arguments of Sharia Siyasiyah, Islamic politics, Islamic policies, Islamic polity, whatever. 
Ibn Taymiyyah considered him, uh, Maududi considered Ibn Taymiyyah as the most profound scholar on these issues. Wise. But I also wanted to show that Sufis have had some impact in politics. Mehtad Purajadi has an interesting book called Mirror to the Prince, an edited volume I'm so jealous of, he didn't feel the need to invite me to join the book. But nevertheless, in that they did do a very good job on Sheikh Saadi, the Persian poet who, who also advised the ruler. A lot of my colleagues told me to do Ghazali as an example of Sufis who had. I'm a big fan of Ghazali, but I think Ghazali was a politician than a Sufi. And uh, I don't know whether he did much political writings after his mystical turn. So I, I couldn't separate the two. And a lot of already written, Umid Safi's dissertation has also done a lot of work on that. I don't think I could add anything new. Plus, I decided to go back and take a second look at Sheikh Saadi for a personal reason. <clears throat> my grandmother, when she would get angry with my grandfather, this is how she would scold him. She would say, talk to me respectfully. I have read Gulistan, Burstan in Persia. So that was a sense of curiosity that she had read Gulistan, Burstan in Persian, so she, was, she wanted everybody to respect her. <laughs> and she was obviously implying that my grandfather didn't know Persian. But, uh, and of course, so I opened Sheikh Saadi's Gulistan. In the first page, the first story allegory that he says, he invokes a verse from the Quran, which by now, if you realize, I have been completely sensitized to every verse of the Quran which has any reference to Ahsan in it, which many other translators <laughs> don't recognize. He cites the verse with his 134th verse in the third surah, which says that, you know, give in charity, be forgiveful, do not be angry. God loves those who are Muslims. And he makes it come out of the mouth of a wise wazir without actually saying this is from the Quran. It's verbatim. I went and looked at the text. version. It is verbatim, not a translation. And so I thought, well, how can I, writing a book on Ihsan, not include a scholar who writes about Ihsan as the way for rulers? So I use Sheikh Saadi as an example. And then finally, I do go and try to advance. It is here that I make the claim that I am the last Islamist standing. Now that Rashid al ghanushi has abandoned it, <laughs> you ask Rashid al ghanushi any question these days, you'll say, one minute, let me call Radwan. What are the liberals saying in Washington, D.C. these days? Oh, that is my answer. Whatever. Pick some liberal, and that is his answer these days. So now that he has given up the Islamist project, I still believe that Muslims can bring Islamic values to the world in such a way that people will not be threatened and people will aspire to these values. Uh, I don't think there is any Muslim on earth who is happy with the state of the global order or state of the order in their countries today. We want change. There are nicer ways about bringing change political change, cultural change, normative changes in our societies without resorting to violence, uh, terrorism, war, instability, etc. So I'm going to, I've already covered these parts. This is how I unpacked Hassan. I talk about Hassan as epistemology, as mercy, as husn, etc. You'll have to read them in the book. This is the most sexiest parts of the book. This is the last chapter in which I argued that we should start thinking of, instead of an Islamic state, we should think of a state of Ihsan. And the pun is intended, because state of Ihsan would be hal, you know? State is a hal, a state is a state, as in a government. So for those who are mystical, they will understand and appreciate it. So I identify five shifts which I would like to see in Muslim thinking and practices and uh, especially for minorities, Muslims as minorities is the second column. I argue that in order to move towards a state of Ahsan, Muslims should start thinking about sovereignty and Tawhid. It's a very complicated argument. You should read that. Andrew March has also written a very interesting book called The Caliphate of Man, which also touches upon these issues. Uh, 
And then I talk about Muslims going back to the model of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and not using the Khulfai Rashidin as a model for creating an Islamic state. This is my critique of Jamaat Islami, for example. Uh, the advantage of moving to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is because that is theologically more sign. He has been sent as example to us, not anybody else, with due respect to everyone. It is his sunnah we are supposed to follow, and in his sunnah he, he had the constitution of Medina, which I talk about both as a constitution as well as a social contract. The first state that he established was a multi-religious, multicultural, multi-ethnic state. Political pluralism is ingrained in the founding principles of the state of Medina, so I have an extensive commentary on the state of Medina uh, and arguing that it would be far more easier for Islamic modernists to make the case for a, an Islamic democracy which is pluralistic and tolerant and compassionate uh, uh, if we follow the constitution of Medina. Uh, some of the great Sufi sheikhs, after spending 70 years teaching it, are now discovering this too. Uh, then I talk about the need to folk move from structure to process. When people talk about Islamic State, Islamic State, they talk about structure of governance, etc. I want to focus not on government, but on governance. <coughs> and move away from structure to process. So, for example, Sheikh Saadi really didn't care how you did it, but he wanted the ruler to be tolerant, compassionate, subservient, and a servant of the rule. So he was more interested in a compassionate outcome rather than institutions and laws regarding of its conduct. So when Islamists talk about an Islamic state, they are talking about legitimacy. Is he coming from emulation of certain practices or implementation of certain laws, regardless of what outcome it comes up with? So the Sufi approach, at least, was not about legitimizing institutions and structures, but uh, going by the outcome. Uh, this is also an interesting debate in America's uh, whether we go by equal opportunity or equal outcome. The Sufis would care less about your equal opportunity institutions. They would just look at the society and say, there is so much inequity. There's something wrong with this society. Your equal opportunity thing doesn't work because the outcomes are so gross. So that is an, uh, an argument that I talk about. I also talk about how it's just either stop talking about national interest and focus on national virtue or make national virtue a part of national interest. And then I also realize how scary it can be because then the state will start disciplining. Chinese could say, this is what we are doing to the Uyghurs. We are teaching them national virtue. Uh, so the model of the state is not very different from what Abdullah Naim recommends, which is to have a secular state with religious society. The state does not implement laws. There are two verses in the Quran, one which says, like Rahaf 18, there is no compulsion in religion. There's another verse which says that we have been selected as a special community to go out there, Amr bil Maruf wa Nahyan al Munkar, to encourage good and forbid evil. Ibn Taymiyyah talks about this as one of the reasons why we need an Islamic state in order to implement good and forbid evil. So, there, in order to achieve good, we force the Islamic law because good is substituted with Islamic law then how do you accommodate that there is no compulsion in faith? So that is the tension that I explore in this chapter. And I talk about justice as something that we should look at more as a social condition than a virtue. So the caliph should be just. I don't know what it means. What does it mean, caliph to be just? We have so many people running for the democratic nomination. Which one of them is more just? I don't know. But I can tell you the society has tremendous inequities. There is an absence of social justice in America today. That I can show it to you statistically. I cannot tell you whether Obama was more just uh, than G.W. Bush or not. The beauty is in the eye of the beholder there. Here it's, a, it's apparent, very difficult to contest. So I think Muslims should start moving away from talking about just rulers and try to look at whether there is social justice in society or not. With the Society of Muslims, this is important. I talk about uh, Muslim citizens as witnesses, as character builders, and the others. I'll just talk about one thing and then open up for question and answers. 
I talk about Sharia by Shura. To arrive at what is Sharia through consultation. And this will obviously seem very uh, controversial. I'm hoping that people will attack me for that so that people will read the other book. But Muslims sometimes don't read the book, they just kill you. But anyway, <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen in my case. But anyway, the Azan is an example of Sharia by Shura. The way we have included Azan, it came through consultation process. Muslims anyway do cherry picking. When they have a problem, they will do consultation. They will ask different imams and then they will pick the answer that they like. So they are arriving at Sharia through consultative process. Anyway, uh, there is a pretty consistent profile of people who call me and ask me questions about various rulings, usually about marriage or, or interest or zakat, etc. And uh, so I clearly see that I'm a product of their shopping. <laughs> They've already shopped for and they, they know that my answer is going to be more to their liking, so that's why they're calling me. If they think my answer is not going to be to their liking, they do not call me at all. So I think we do that anyway. What I mean by saying by Shura is let everybody, all stakeholders, advance their understanding of Sharia. Let the Salafi say this is Sharia. Let the Sufi say this is what it is, and all in the middle and beyond. And let the masses decide what they want to choose. All I want is to remind them that God says. So when you hear the words of God, try to extract the most beautiful meaning. I know that this is very idealistic. I don't think that Ehsan will be realized institutionally or nationally. But what I do want to do is that all of us aspire to have one or two moments of Ehsan in our lives. And I also believe that it is a responsibility of ethical thinkers in politics to say, look, it's a very ugly thing we do when we put children in cages. The beautiful policy would be this. This would be a beautiful way to deal with this challenge. We cannot afford it maybe today, but let's not forget what is the right thing to do, even if we cannot. So I want at least Muslim scholars to be able to articulate what is the Ahsan position so that we feel guilty when we depart from the beautiful. I think to do ugly things is an affront to God. But we won't know that we are doing things in an ugly fashion unless there is a constituency in the society which can articulate what is the beautiful thing to do. And that's why we should not wear Ahsan. That is why we should unveil Ahsan. Thank you very much.